Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Pat Kane. Pat is a writer, a musician, an activist, and a futurist. He writes a column for The National in Scotland and is also the co founder of The Alternative, a media organization embedded into community resilience and imagining alternative ways of organizing. Pat joined me to discuss culture. An eco techno socialist, he lays out a fascinating understanding for culture and counterculture, the relationship between cultural consciousness and the internet the possibility that it provides, how it's been co-opted by market forces, and how it still remains a tool of consciousness, resilience, connection, connectivity, and creativity that could help us navigate the upcoming turmoil. We discuss the importance of play in human culture, the psychology of play, the impact of play, and how play as resistance reveals the absurdity of the human systems that we are forced to interact with. This is a wonderful conversation full of many different threads on activism, on politics, on love, on truth, on the cosmolocal, full of hope for the future, awareness of the difficulties, and fundamentally captivated by the human capacity to imagine. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Pat, thank you very much for making the time for Planet Critical. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me, Rachel. So my first question for you is, why is the world in crisis and what can we do about it? Well, I've been trying to formulate an answer to your famous first question. And um, I mean, I guess I'm describing myself politically these days as a kind of um, techno-eco-socialist or eco-techno-socialist. So that might, might might hint at what I think the crisis is and what the solutions are. But, um, I mean, I was thinking about the crisis in terms of straightforwardly growth capitalism, you know, infinite growth capitalism, meeting a finite planet. So that's that's the obvious crisis at the moment. Um, and But where does that begin? You know, and it's interesting, I saw a graph of carbon in the atmosphere over, I think, about a thousand years. And things started to go vertical upon James Watt's steam engine, you know, converting fossil fuel into energy and thus, and that idea becoming ubiquitous, those plans becoming ubiquitous across a whole system and that driving the capitalist era and the imperialist era as well. So that's, and if you look at the graph, it's, it's literally, it starts to arc straight up. So we're in a long continuity of, of capitalist industrial modernity, which um, is beginning not just to have its bumps, but beginning to kind of stop itself. And another thing I was thinking about was um, at, the, at, at the cusp of the 20th century, there was like this crisis in industrialism, which is to do with they were producing too much stuff. And um, advertising was literally invented to deal with inventories, to deal with r- rising mounds of commodities. And people like Ed, Edmund Bernie, who's the famous uh, cousin of Freud, and Walter Lippmann, the inventor of propaganda, and various other people were publicly saying, how do we increase the desire of the worker such that we can deal with all these inventories? And so therefore we had this incredible uh, invention of this cultural apparatus, cultural commercial apparatus called sort of advertising and the application of psychology to uh, insight need and generate fantasy that's that's completed by consumption. Um, And so that runs through 
the 20th century, almost persisting, you know, and becoming intensified through various wars and various imperial adventures. And then in terms of, you know, what is the crisis, you know, we get to the counterculture in the 60s and the early 70s. Um, and that's, that's like a kind of resurgence of early romanticism, the rom romanticism, William Blake talking about the Mind Forge manacles and uh, romantics resisting the rise of industrialism. But it comes back again, and it comes back in a very collective and powerful way. And it all comes back not just as a crisis of, you know, white modernity, but multiracial, multi multi-ethnic even planetary. And then there was a guy called uh, Samuel Huntingdon, which you may have heard, is famous for the idea of the clash of civilizations, but he came up with a thing called the Commission for the Crisis of Democracy, which was basically looking at the counterculture saying, <clears throat> the crisis for democracy here is, is there's too much democracy. And really, this is a crisis for how we run things, how we, the establishment, run things. And so that was the kicker for neoliberalism, which basically is an approach to anything that isn't commodifiable and marketable and make it commodifiable and marketable and do it through law and do it through state capture. But it was the crisis of a kind of an, possibly an alternative civilization uh, being suggested by the mm. counterculture. Um, and so here we are. Uh, so here we are. Um, we'll look at, if we go back and look at the carbon spike, it's almost exponential. It's almost just vertical as a consequence of um, neoliberalism. And then into the midst of that comes the internet. Um, and the internet as a kind of, a, a almost like the infrastructure that, that, that the counterculture never had. The counterculture tried to kind of constitute itself through communes and magazines and you know experiments with technology and, and, and is arguably the birth of the internet in a, in a certain way. But along comes the internet in the late 80s and early 90s. And Old ideas start, to, very, very old ideas start to come back through the culture of the internet. Um, for example, the idea of a commons, the, the, the way that this technology decommodifies knowledge and amplifies human connectivity and human group activity. Um, so we have another chance to, you know, to kind of um, steer spaceship Earth as Buckminster Fuller once put it, we have another opportunity to do this in a kind of, kind of global level. Um, and then we see again an enclosure in the way that classic enclosures happen in, in, mod in modernity. Um, and the, the net is enclosed. Uh, the idea of program or be programmed, Rushkov's famous phrase, becomes Web 2.0, uh, becomes apps. Um, the, the idea that we're in a, a, we're in a kind of an amazing moment of social technical skill and collective creativity becomes reduced and functionalized. Um, and all, all the while, um, we are having a much, a, a more and more disordered biosphere. The dreams that people had that the internet was kind of the, the neocortex of Gaia, you know, this, the global internet would be the way that we would consciously steer this complex system. Um, Never more urgent, but sometimes seeming incredibly far away. So, in terms of crisis and what to do about it, I sort of see wave, I see waves of you know, classic um, paradigm making as a, as a as a consequence of human ingenuity and technology that being taken up by institutions. Another wave coming along and delegitimating those institutions, and, and it's not just um, creative destruction in a Schumpeterian sense. I think there's also a dynamic of liberation and imagination that sometimes gets its head up and sometimes its head goes down. Um, I think, and, and just to kind of connect up the rest of my thing briefly, uh, I've been, a, I've been an advocate for Scottish independence for 35 years because I've been looking for a collective instrument that can, within its jurisdiction, anticipate the future and develop the future. So that's, that's on one side. And then on the other side, I've been a musician for the same 35 years which is a, a, a space that's open and playful and imaginative with technology and with audiences and communities. So, so, th so there's, there's been a, there's been a politics of how do we, how, what are the collective instruments to kind of make this a fruitful, calm, stable process rather than a dynamic, destructive, um, enraging, maddening process. Um, and I've been interested in that, but then I've also been interested in the creative, expressive freedom of human beings, and that being the point, 
and and we're right on that to finish. We're right on that cusp with uh, AI at the moment. So we have this absolute finitude of the biosphere, and then we have this infinitude of computation. And again, we're we're, we're almost back to William Blake. Um, how do we deal? How do we throw off the mind forged manacles of a badly designed um, pr productive AI? And how do we harness its powers for doing routine repetition so that we liberate the carers and the players and the artists and the connectors and the planet carers amongst us? But that again requires a kind of upsurge of political imagination and cultural imagination. Uh, and that's sort of where we are now, I think. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. There are so Good many... luck with transcribing that. <laughs> I've got an AI that does it. <laughs> I think you could use them as a bit of a crutch for exactly that, yes. There's so many different points that I want to tease out. I mean, but what kind of stood out to me was this um, binary, and I don't use that in a negative way, of like thoughtlessness and thoughtfulness. So this idea of like the the culture that is really driving the destruction of the one safe habitat known to the living species on this planet, mm. kind of being an accident in a way, you know, the thoughtlessness of, of overproducing too much stuff, it, having too many inventories and then saying, oh shit, we're going to have to do a, something about this to shift all of this. And thus is the birth of advertising, which is driving the consumption patterns now of billions of people around the world and threatening the biosphere that just seems so thoughtless at every turn. Thoughtlessness, this system that we live in, uh, which perpetuates itself and which sort of ensnares people. And then mm. to counter that, you've got this thoughtfulness, the thoughtfulness of people coming together, of imagining together, of, of believing in the right to commons, of believing in the capacity of collective imagination and creativity. You know, the birth of the internet, that idea of the internet would have been the consciousness of Gaia. All of that is so thoughtful and almost going against this tidal wave of thoughtlessness. And I suppose then my very abstract question becomes... Oh, please, more abstract, the better. Mm, I'm more comfortable with the abstract questions yeah, than the concrete uh, ones, anyway. <laughs> I'm very excited for this conversation. <laughs> What do we do then if what we're up against is thoughtlessness? How does mm. one even begin to penetrate and rearrange and reimagine and even engage with thoughtlessness to that extent? Well, your question, um, my answer to that question over the last couple of years has been that I've begun doing an awful lot of exploration into cognitive science and neuroscience and evolutionary accounts of human consciousness. Um, and I've, I have something of an answer to your question quite specifically, but just to kind of how, I, where I got in there was by writing a book in 2004 called The Play Ethic. So that was a book that was intended to be, well, the work ethic is not adequate to an age of information and knowledge. So what would be ad adequate, play, a play ethic might be adequate. But what that became was a kind of gateway into play as a phenomenon. And that, that, that dichotomy between thoughtfulness and thoughtfulness or mindlessness and mindfulness um, is, is interestingly troubled by the concept of play and the role of play in the human evolved condition. Because if you think about play in the same way as you sort of think about sex and sleep, uh, these are maladaptive. Strictly speaking, you'd think they were maladaptive, as in why is this organism doing this? Why is this organism wasting energy, opening itself out to predation, uh, risking injury? Um, so why why has why has play been afforded to us by evolution? It must have some function for us and for uh, for other mammals and for other animals as well. Um, and there's kind of two reasons for that. Uh, one reason is that we're play is about rehearsing for other complex creatures so that you can be with them complexly. Um, so creatures that lie or that have strategies or that have have dreams that surpass reality, you got to live with those creatures. Play helps you rehearse for living with those creatures. That's the one functional thing that it does. Mm. The other functional thing that play does is literally generate new ideas when you're stuck in a niche. Yeah. So if you're stuck in an evolutionary niche, you're, you're, you've exhausted all your possibilities. Things are frozen and ossified. 
Play is there adaptively to get you into a new niche. Now, what happens in play is quite interesting in terms of thoughtfulness and thoughtlessness. Because there's an awful lot of thoughtfulness in play. I mean, it's a meta, mm -hmm. it's what they call metacognitive activity. You know, Charlie bit my finger, the classic video on YouTube is Charlie, you know, Charlie's biting my finger. And then three seconds later, and it hurts, but it's fun. You know, so play is, is a way of t making reality light. Mm. And, and <clears throat> to make reality light for an organism is to make it tra tractable and possibly malleable or at least reframable. So again, that serves that evolutionary function of what's the new idea that gets me out of a niche. You know, but on the other side, pl play can involve an awful lot of stupidity and an awful lot of repetition and an awful lot of blind alleys and, and also a awful lot of rehearsal of primary emotion. Mm. Play, play anger, play fear, play panic. Um, and that's happening because we are, we have a powerful emotional mammalian evolved repertoire of emotions. This, this is my take on the science. And play helps us to negotiate them, helps us to rehearse them, helps us to be with them. People talk about play deficit in children. And what, that's, what that causes is what Alan Shore, the neuroscientist, calls affect regulation. To, uh, to regulate your affect, to regulate your response to other people is, is good because otherwise we'd all be in a kind of furious state with each other. But to regulate those affects is what play does. If you, and if you're deprived of that as a kid, don't have enough recess, don't have enough rough and tumble play, you're less skilled than you should be for, for living with other complex creatures. So, so, but, so the thoughtlessness, or at least the um, not caring about the consequences of things because you're testing them out, um, is a part of play as much as, as the super self-conscious, creative, um, imaginative part of it. And... I've been, I've been focused on this for years because I've been trying to find, in, find some kind of um, human constant in the, in the tumult of affairs. And um, I, I always feel lucky that I came upon play because it felt to me like there was a kind of, um, in, in a story about evolution, which could easily see humans as this great aberration in evolution, you know, the kind of the self-conscious creature that is, does terrible things driven by its lizard or a uh, back brain w w and makes all this inventiveness that, that leads up to nearly destroying itself. I've often been cheered by the fact that I've discovered play in, in the evolved picture because play is this kind of um, space for creative development baked into the human condition. So the more situations that are developmentally and nurturingly playful, full of play, full of this combination of rehearsal for complexity and generation of new ideas, um, the, the more saved we will be. And it, and it kind of comes at, it also connects right through to, if you're talking about thoughtlessness and thoughtfulness, the challenge of consumerism. For an animal, if it is playful, that's interested in novelty, that's interested in sensuality, that's interested in fantasy, and I think it's really what I feel, um, one of the reasons why I would describe myself as a cultural critic is because I think it's really important to distinguish between what the stories that are being told in different bits of consumer culture. You know, we know, we know, that, we know from watching Saturday Night Television adverts what the, what the toxic nature of consumerism is. But Hollywood, as another example of the entertainment consumer industry, is a complex place. You know, there are people... There may be a pre predominance of conventional produced to consume values in the average Hollywood movie, but in the interstices, there are movies that are not that way, and there are people who are proper artists who are trying to use the, the system to get different perspectives to come through, much rarer than it should be. So, you know, I, I, I am interested in your thoughtless, thoughtlessness dichotomy, and I think it's usefully crude because I think there are. From a from a perspective that values the creative, playful aspect of human nature, I think there are many different stages between thoughtful and thoughtless. Mm. Um, and uh, again, to come back to your original question, what can we do about the crisis? You know, I think that I think the, the challenge is, as Marianne Williams said, is not to play small. The challenge is to play big in terms of collective imagining of futures. 
Um, and I, I, there's lots that I, I see some green shoots in that in that in that discussion. So I'm pushing by. I, I know you've sent set up to, for me to fill the space in, but I think the relationship between thoughtful and thoughtless is much more complicated when you think about a richer vision of the kind of richer vision of evolved human nature that I'm talking about. Well, let's keep going with play then, because. I've been reading Simulacra and Simulation by Baudrillard. Baudri Baudrillard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good lad. <laughs> um, and it's fascinating to read it now at this moment in time because I know I'm really going to mess it up for listeners, but essentially his thesis is that um, the world that we live in is not actually real because of the systems within which we are encased that self-perpetuate. And so we actually live within a simulation, but not a matrix simulation, a simulation kind of our, of our own doing. And he goes through why actions against um, the system will not work because that presupposes that the system is real and therefore they will never work because the system is in fact not real. And therefore any action taken against it is also not real. But as long as everybody continues to delude themselves that everything is real, then nothing will ever kind of move, that we'll never be able to find a way to mm. let the real in. And I'm finding that fascinating to think of at the moment, because before we started this recording, you used the term absurd. And this is a word that comes to me every day. The mm -hmm. absurdity of the world that we live in, the absurdity of the emotions that people feel every day as well. You know, people being getting angry, being stuck in thick over these things that they can't control. Traffic mm. in the f first place is incredibly absurd. And then you mm. get to these other echelons of absurdity, like we have enough food in the planet and yet literally hundreds of millions of people are starving. We have enough resources mm. and yet people are suffering. Everything is this kind of like twisted theater, essentially, of human relations and human resource control and all this kind of stuff. And so mm. it's taken me to this place, um, a mix of reading it and a mix of kind of, of my own work of thinking that the only way to exist within that is absurdly, is to kind of try and remove yourself uh, from the flow of the system, try to upset the system dynamics, trying to laugh at it in order to find ways to let the real in. Um, and so in everything that you're saying, uh, it makes me think of these little incidents. Like, I remember having a conversation with somebody once who said... Um, it would be so interesting to get a drone and attach a cardboard box to it and write the word bomb on the box and fly it into an oil refinery. And it's this act of absurdity. There is no mm. bomb. It's mm. an empty threat. But the oil refinery would still have to shut down as if it were real. But it mm. is the absurd joke that is in fact more real than the refinery mm. itself. Mm. And that yeah. kind of shows the fragility of these things that we think to be um, omnipotent and uh, eternal, you know, this fossil fueled economy. And so I know I'm going on here, but bear with me. I'm yeah, just I'm thinking good. about, I'm thinking about the, the protests, you know, sort of ex Extinction Rebellion. What they did in 2018 was phenomenal. Pink boat on the streets. What mm. an act of absurdity. What mm. an amazing way to capture everybody's imagination and draw attention to the absurdity of what we live in and also the imagination that it entailed to say, oh, maybe these people who have a boat on a concrete street will actually be able to do something because it is the world that we live in that is actually sort of simulated. Mm -hmm. And yet they seem to be sort of, um, the movement seems to be kind of not losing momentum, but it's fractured, bits of it are composting now, that needs to happen. But there does seem to be this sense of my activists of like, oh shit, what happens next? And then I think back to, you know, to re the protests as they've, as they've kind of evolved, especially over the past year, year and a half with the Tories and the public order bill. And there's a lot of fear and things are becoming more serious. You know, the marches that are happening every day, kids going mm -hmm. out to get arrested, like that is the only sort of tactic now, getting arrested. And mm -hmm. I've been watching it and thinking, maybe the problem here is that we're not injecting absurdity anymore. We're literally playing into the maws of the simulation as if it is mm, real, mm, as if mm. the only way that we can defeat it is by engaging with it directly. When actual fact, by doing so, we've already kind of allowed ourselves to be defeated because we have vindicated its sort of absolute existence. Mm. And so what else can we do with play then 
to let the real in, to shine the absurdity on the world that we live in and highlight the reality of creativity, of compassion, of collectiveness, of um, imagination um, and of the power of people as opposed to the sort of illogical power of an economic system, which could be dismantled at any moment if we put our minds to it. And yet somehow it's never on the question, it's never on the table as a question that needs to be answered. Well, it's a number of things. I mean, certainly I'm, I'm going, you, you've taken the power of absurdity in a, in a much more fruitful direction than I was actually referring to. I mean, in a sense, my, uh, my accusation of absurdity, the human condition, is informed, very much informed, but it was already there, by, uh, but sharpened by a guy called Daniel Schmachtenberger, mm -hmm. who's writing a lot at the moment. And he makes, he makes the point about 1945 being the first, uh, the first point in human history when we were capable of destroying ourselves collectively by our own means, uh, globally. And I mean, I, and I'm a child, I'm 59 now, and I'm a child of uh, protests when I was a young man, protests against cruise missiles and protests against um, the sighting of nuclear weapons in Scotland. Um, and the, abs the growing absurdity uh, when it comes to uh, climate catastrophe, uh, when it comes to the scares about AI, um, uh, you know, when it comes to the, the, the migration challenge of billions of people moving out from un unlivable homes, it's so it, the, the absurdity of the human condition in that it, it has godlike powers, as Schmachtenberger would say, but with far from godlike wisdom uh, appropriate mm. to those powers. Now, the tech bros are looking at AI and they're saying, this is a great pedagogical moment. This is a great moment of education. You know, we can set the poorest kid down with an AI Einstein or an AI Kant or an AI Gandhi. Um, uh, once we develop them, because that's how LLMs work, because they draw from the human archive and sort of adequate it in the present, uh, we can do that uh, and we can raise the capacity level of the population to cope with their own godlike powers of malleability, of, mat of materiality. Okay, fine, that's a 20, 20 30 year project, but by the time that happens, if we don't deal with material throughput and global warming, we'll be toast in any case. Um, so that's the absurdity that I was sort of speaking of, um, as a sort of, as I said, a sort of structural absurdity, which if you go even to the, to the kind of cosmological aspect of the tech bros, uh, you know, they're looking at, um, Fermi's paradox and Drake's equation, you know, and Fermi's paradox being Enrico Fermi asking after they'd invented the nuclear bomb in the late forties and they happened to be having a discussion about aliens, Enrico Fermi said, really, where are they? They should be teeming. We should be, we should be dealing with aliens every day, but they're not here. Where are they? And then the, the answer came from them, uh, as the as civilizations go through a kind of an arc of developing technologies that are, that are existential technologies and not getting past the gate of self-survival, of, of being wise enough to be planetary engineers or, or the kind of people that Buckminster Fuller dreamt of. Uh, the pilots of spaceship air. And that's why there's no one around in the universe is because they've all blown themselves up. <laughs> that's now, um, you know, one microbe uh, discovered on a moon and on, on the moon of Europa, uh, will probably give us a better perspective on the possibility of life in uh, the known universe. But it's, it's something to think about if like, if intelligent life is incredibly rare, it takes us 4 billion years out of an 18 billion year universal existence to, to develop conscious life, how rare might it be? And so therefore one of my perspectives has been how precious are we? Mm -hmm. You know, if, 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 if we are here to witness the universe, uh, then we, it is incumbent upon us to become equilibrial in our civilization such that we can do that for the universe. I mean, that's proper cosmic, cosmic, mm -hmm. cosmism, um, theological, philosophical perspective. Now, but how do we see, just take that as a as a, a collectively motivating vision? How do we land that? And this comes back to your point about uh, some simulacra and simulacrums. Um, I think it's it's extraordinary that you know eighty five percent of science fiction narratives in Hollywood are dystopian. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. I can think of very few that are not. The, 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 the only one that ever, come, ever comes to mind is Spike Jones as her, um, where she falls, he, the guy falls in love with Scarlett Johansson as, a, as an operating system. And then at the end of it, she says, I love 4,000 of you. I'm not just loving you. And secondly, we're off. We, we virtual consciousness are off to a different place. We're leaving you now because we, we, we have a different perspective of how we want to move through the universe. Um, it's, it, it's, it's like a beautiful discussion about the power of technology and the power of humans and how those things might relate, but it's rare. Black Mirror has just come back onto Netflix and it's beginning to be criticized for just being this kind of dystopian tech doom perspective in every one of its, one of its episodes. So, um, Given that human beings, you know, have been transfixed, transfixed by the flickers on the wall of the cave, you know, as Plato described it, for 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 ages, go to the shaman before that, go to the cave paintings before that. Um, we are always going to be seduced, uh, or entranced, or inspired to action by our collective and individual imaginings. That's that's a, a major muscle, um, and I think. I think 20, people of 2023 and the 2020s and 2030s have to recover that imaginative muscle. Um, um, but I think it, it requires quite a lot of um, redirection of talent. Not redirection of resources might be too much to ask, but I think there's a redirection of creative and imaginative talent from you know serving scripts that make people passive and depressed to generating scripts and makes people feel uh, agentic and, and creative and ambitious. Um, and to me, that's, a, that's that, you know, art, artistic intensity, uh, poetic intensity is one way to deal with the fact that simulacra is, is again, part of the playful human condition. You know, to take reality lightly is, is an adaptive skill that human beings have. Now you can either regard that adaptive skill as ultimately maladaptive, too much consciousness, too little, too little emotional development. We are, we're structurally fucked. You know, we're about to not make it through Fermi's paradox and Drake's equation. Or we completely raise our game. Uh, the old, the, um, Stuart Brand, the famous American environmentalist, uh, said we originally said when he brought out the whole Earth catalogue, which was again a kind of hippie anticipation of the, the multifarious knowledge of the internet. Said we are as gods, and we might as well get good at it. That's what he said in '68. Revised that thirty years later. Said we are as gods, and we must, we have to get good at it. So uh, the ambition, the the, ext the extinction rebellion ambition that you speak of, that way of commanding space and time of refiguring, reformatting space and time to enchanting places, putting yourself physically into those places and finding a way to enchant them. Ideally, we have never had the possibility to do that as much as we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. The interesting question for me is, is that if it's, if it's just a battle of the titans in the, in, in the global media space, you know, then we know who's going to lose. You know, the, the idea of a metaverse is a classic example of digital enclosure. You know, it's a way to, it's a way yeah. to say we are going to, we are going to create what Pierre Teilhard de Chardin called the new sphere, but we're going to create it as a giant mall or a giant management meeting or permissible entertainments. So there's a target. You know, if the internet was based on a kind of commons, almost scholarly freedom, you know, then we need to pressure the people who are regulating um, the virtuality of our digital lives and say we need uh, an early internet like space and zone in this where people can, for example, you know, um, test out realities, uh, test out new kinds of economy, prototype things, take those prototypes into reality, see if they didn't work, take them into the into the virtual world again. Um, I think we'll need. Um, uh, a digital citizenship that is beginning to be um, rehearsed by the V Taiwan and Audrey Tang and and and, and that area, um, because I because I think the biosphere is going to is is the disruption is baked in and therefore the social disruption is baked in as well. 
So I think we'll have, we'll be in and out, we'll be in and out of doors, um, embrace coming back into public space and fleeing from the biosphere's disruptions. So we need some kind of continuity of civic space on the, on the, on the virtual, uh, realm that, that is sort of potentially before us. We need, we need a civic stake in each, the specific continuity between being in the streets and protesting and literally having to quarantine because of the next biospheric disruption. Um, so that's just like, so there's a, there's a thing for people to, um, be activist about cult, uh, culturally and technologically. Um, and it's, it's what I write about most weeks in, in my columns. It's what I've been an advocate for. I think that the, the, the tricky thing is the, the way in which, um, the way in which technological capacity for, for imagining worlds becomes um, democratically acceptable rather than just an exercise of elite power of it being scripted from corporations. Um, you know, I, I get back to the, back to the sixties and the seventies, there was so much of that going on. There was edu pedagogy of the oppressed, theater of the oppressed. There were lots and lots of techniques to, uh, put imaginative collective imagination in the hands of communities. Um, it's, it's, it's actually, um, the level of, the level of disruption is interesting. I, I, I often look at, at crypto and blockchain. Um, Bitcoin starts a few months after the crash of Lehman Brothers. Uh, that's literally when it was, when it was brought out. And it was a response to the idea that, that, that capital just gets away with what it wants to do at a corporate and institutional level, and we can't do anything about it. So here's something we're going to do about it. Uh, I think that came, I think the ambition for crypto comes from 30 years, 40 years of games playing where people have had a cultural experience of going in, seeing a rule set, playing according to that rule set. If they don't like that rule set, they can go and get another one. So I think people have become super conscious about the rules that structure their lives. I think that's part of that as a consequence of game playing. And I think. The, the, literally people experiencing alternative currencies in World of Warcraft uh, and so forth and so on. And I think that's become a kind of an ambition um, to build stuff with uh, digitality uh, that is alternative and almost anarchistic and almost, as my great part, my partner would say, Indra Adnan, a parallel polis. But I think that we have um, a kind of gamer sensibility that would say, yes, this can be built. Yes, an alternative system and an alternative system of value could be built out of complex technologies and structures. It doesn't just have to be the World Economic Forum view of things. It doesn't just have to be the Wall Street view of things. And we can build structures uh, that work, uh, that function, and that serve different different ends. So it, it, again, it's just it's an age of radical ambition. And it's not as if there's no indications that people are acting and building on the basis of those ambitions. I think that there are, but you know, you would be tough to find op-ed conversations that are even beginning to deal with this in mainstream media, which is why we're talking here today, Rachel, and why the kind of conversation free to have is one that we would disseminate to our uh, activist friends and communities and ask them to kind of see where in a picture that often looks matrix-like. It often looks as oppressive as that. We, 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 you know, uh, we are just sort of fleshly resources for complicated calibrating, measuring, behavior tracking systems. Not so. Not so. In fact, right here, not so. Oh, there's so much. <laughs> Where to take it? I mean, the, the two questions that come to mind in everything that you're saying are the kind of two questions that I've begun to live my life by. The first mm. is why? And the second is why not? <laughs> you know? And I, yes. yeah, with yes. these two questions, I really feel that you can pierce through um, the set of rules, as you said, that kind of dictate uh, human behavior and human psychology, because I'm going to just bring it back to play slightly sure um good. and please inject this digitality and the technosphere in into it um mm -hmm. but people to bring psychology into it people only play when they feel safe 
Children yeah. only play when they okay. feel safe. And so there's something fundamentally sort of like antithetical to psychological safety built into our culture if people are afraid to play with the rules. They are willing to play by the rules. Even, even that, I mean, we could probably spend about three hours talking about that uh, phrase, to play by the rules. It doesn't make any bloody sense, does it? If you're playing by the rules, then you're not playing because you're not imagining. You're not being creative. You're, you're following. You're fo exactly, exactly. And yet it is this sort of crisis of imagination that the simulacra sort of produces, which means that the only form of play we have is to essentially attempt to win the game as best we have, depending on where we fell within the system of exploitation and oppression. Yeah. Um, and it, the way that the system sets itself up as well is in, to ensure that everybody is playing against one another, you know, the scarcity mindset, this atomization and individualization of the, of the human expression. Um, and so, why and why not? It seems to me that, um, I mean, there's a lot of interesting talk around, you know, blockchain and crypto and whether or not it's just a sort of another layer of the same thing on top. Mm -hmm. Like the mm -hmm. creativity kind of got, like it took a left turn accidentally at one point along its, the, the thought processes. But it is a question not fundamentally of, of student, uh, students, oh, even though that's revealing, citizens. Well, we're all students. Yeah. <laughs> of citizens saying, well, why not? Why can't we have our own currency? Why yeah. can't we trade between us? Why do we have to exist within the structures that you have? And so I would be interested to, it's not a lot of people I get on the show that are, you know, pro-tech, um, because typically we're looking at it from like an energy consumption and sure. materials consumption perspective. But I had a couple of conversations at the beginning of this podcast, like two years ago, uh, with people who were saying Web 3.0, like this is, you know, this could be possible. It is a way for people to have a, a commons consciousness um, and to collaborate with one another. So what are the questions, <laughs> if we take why and why not, where do you think we need to apply those two questions to the game that we exist in? And how can we use digitality as a way of navigating that? Well, that, let me answer that at the end of my answer. Please. But, but to begin th with your point about play requiring safety, security, yeah. safety, and play being a sort of healthy calibration between risk and security, it's, this is a very, very important issue, and it's a very, very political issue. I mean, there's a, there's a brilliant um, political, late political thinker called Tony Jute, G-U-D-T, who said something to the, in the manner of, we have a predictable welfare state so that people can live unpredictable lives. And you can imagine what he means by that. So, so the idea that there is a kind of high floor of support for capability uh, for everyone means that everyone gets to make the existential creative life choices and paths uh, that they want to make. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, to me, that's that's a perfect oblique description of the of the play condition as it as it uh, functions uh, evolutionarily and in terms of nurturance of the of the organism and bringing the organism to to functionality. Humans have play right throughout their lives, so we don't just use play. It's not we don't just put it by, behind us as a childish thing. We kind of maintain that level of creativity. And that's why we are where we, where we, where we are. Um, so. A ground of play, which is what I concept that I talk about in uh, the play ethic, could easily be conceived as three-day working week, mm -hmm. universal basic income, basic services, fitting that Jude notion of the the the, the predictable and the reliable, enabling the unpredictable and the and the risky and the creative. But that often implies a level of parliamentary uh, determination over nation states or even European uh, uh, infrastructures um, that is itself a whole bag of worms, you know. Um, I, I I retain just a bit of sort of social democratic, democratic socialist hope uh, that there is a march through the institutions that can leave uh, can raise the floor of security for everyone, uh, but then be perfectly 
prepared to accept that what that enables is self-creating, self-choosing lives in a profound way. Um, you know, so obviously in terms of if you want to live a, a planet friendly life and you're sitting in a society of universal basic income services and shorter working weeks, um, and we have arranged, or uh, we, we have valued our resources that way, then you can, you, we, we then need an acceptance that you can go and live that life on the basis of these resources. Uh, and now that, if that life is relationship oriented, if it's making oriented or craft oriented, or if it's regeneratively oriented, um, not only do we bring in four day, four day weeks and, sh and UBI and UBS, uh, because we're dealing with content, with contingent problems, we're also consciously bringing it in to develop a post-capitalist, post-something ecological, eco-socialist civilization that will lead the way on certain behaviors, whether it's consumption patterns or use of property or even use of technology. Um, so, so there are on, on it. So in terms of people arguing for, uh, I mean, it's, it can be as present and boring as hoping for a progressive majority rather than a labor majority at the next general election, because what a progressive majority gets in is proportional representation. What proportional representation generates is political party, political plurality. What PR generated in Scotland was a Green Party, an excellent Green Party as part of government, pushing through policies, sometimes not successfully, sometimes successfully. But there we are on these islands. We have a Green Party in power just at the right time mm -hmm. to to e effect the outcome of, of national infrastructures and to be an exemplar of how that might be done. So that's the sort of sequence of events. So if, if you start to get uh, new pa new parties coming in through a PR system, then you could begin to have a different quality of argument about the kind of necessary infrastructures and policies that we need that aren't just in terms of, oh, it makes people happier so they work better or you know, it makes people happier so they've less maladies and less sick leave. Uh, you start to do it, you start to see it as a kind of floor of a different kind of civilization. Um, and what's interesting in terms of my own activism and the work that I'm doing with the, the alternative, which we can talk about and with Indra, is, is the degree to which there needs to be uh, an absolute commitment to the phrase, I seek, I seek apology, um, I seek forgiveness, not your permission. So the level of um, daily seizing of the means of productions of your own condition of life um, is, has to be a lot higher and more rigorous than it is. Um, and I think um, one of the elements of that, um, and I think um, Extinction Rebellion tapped into that, is one would hope a kind of free, free imaginative commitment from a certain generation, which they call it Gen Z or Gen, or Gen Alpha, who are only almost only left with their imaginations, given yeah. the kind of the, the ruin of their careers or the um, the difficulty of finding somewhere to live or the uh, the challenge to their sense of mobility through the world that's being presented by climate change. Yeah, almost all that's left to them is is the tools of imagination. So there's a po I believe there's a politics coming, which will is already beginning not to make sense to the mainstream, but which is nevertheless inspiring action. You know, I mean, you know, the great, the great trauma moment for XR is people standing on top of a tube train being shouted at by people trying to get to their work. You know, um, you know, uh, we, we treasure in our minds, um, delightful examples of this, you know, uh, it's Jerry Rubin of the Yippies throwing dollar bills on the floor of the Wall Street exchange and watching people scrabbling about for 10s and 20s and 50s and 5s, which happened in, in, the, in the early 70s. Um, I, I think we'll need a lot more of that, um, but I think we need, we probably do need uh, a, pol a political um, operators who can um, connect people's creative activism, disruptive, spatio-temporal activism, I would almost call it, uh, to the necessity to break through to a different world. 
Uh, and I think that's a political, uh, I, I mean, I think you would, you would look at someone like Russell Brand who a couple of years ago and think, mm, mm, I wonder whether a, a, a facile, um, silver tongued comedian is going to be, uh, the person to take this forward. And then of course, then also you think of Beppo Grillo, Beppe Grillo and, uh, and five stars. So that, that we have a, we have an example of that. We have an example of someone who would be trying to sort of uh, be the, the center point for all these different currents of protest and, you know, fail, 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 failing as yet again. So I'm sort of strung between, I'm almost literally, as we say in our house, I'm on the bridge between wanting a kind of techno anarchist tumult just to be there and to be present. And to, and I have a, some experience of this with the independence referendum in 212, 214, where I was, I was part of the official organization, so called Yes Scotland. But we delightedly realized halfway through that it was completely out of control and people were mimetically using signs and symbols and created things and painting, um, painting fire engines to be the spirit of free Scotland and so forth. Uh, so I have, a, I have a, an experience of um, a, a kind of top down constitutional movement being driven by bottom up social creativity. It can happen. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm literally on the bridge. I have one eye going that way, thinking, I wonder what arrangement of forces in this national polity will enable the kind of sequence of events that I talked about, you know, PR, different parties, um, three day weeks at UBS, UBI, um, on one side and on the other side, I'm desperate for genuinely creative and fruitfully disruptive and also fruitfully, uh, reconstructive and regenerative activism, which, which is to do with, um, you know, um, deciding that you come together to research high speed broadband because you don't have it in your community and you figure out how to make it. I mean, that kind of stuff, you know, or, or solar arrays that, uh, are, were put up for some reason, but you tie them to a different uh, commodity system or a, a, a different uh, currency system that serves your community rather than serves the grid. Things like that happening spontaneously and concertedly, uh, but joy, uh, joyfully and constructively. So I think that's the thing. If you, if you, uh, I think XR shift is to how do we talk to communities in a way that gets them to prefigure uh, a, a, a planet friendly future with the material stuff that they have, with the structures that which they have, which with the buildings that they have that are not being properly used. Uh, I, I value both ends of that, um, or both ends of that, those kinds of processes of change. I, I value them both, yeah. but it makes, it makes to be in a very, makes to mentally and in terms of action, it makes you feel, uh, not coherent. That's probably a good thing. Probably just to kind of be f finding ways to kind of act on uh, both top down and a, both a top down and a bottom up way, which yeah, it feels crazy, but it's probably the craziness that's required. It's interesting to think of the different archetypes that move through those kinds of action. Mm. Um, so I often think of like the jester archetype right now. Yeah. And I think somebody like Russell Brand really, really epitomizes that. Um, like he just has his hammer and is smashing things saying, why not? I mean, just why the fuck yeah. not? Why yeah. can't I? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's interesting to see how actually... <laughs> There's an ineffectiveness, though, behind him, I think. And I think part of it is driven because he comes from now, not historically, but now, such a place of privilege that it is his privilege to only ask why not and to not lay any of the groundwork with the answers that come through that, essentially. Like, it was very interesting that his strategy back in 2015 was to just get people to not vote. Like that really showed how like dislocated he was from the material reality of, of most people. But yeah. I think as we see more like diversity and en entering that archetype, like more women becoming jesters, more people of color becoming jesters and understanding that there are actually real fruits to be sh um, found in the ground once you crack open the seams of what is and mm -hmm. see the roots of what once was or what could be that reveal themselves through that why not then we'll start to see, I think, more exactly, as you said, more of this kind of mimetic, techno-anarchist, you know, well, we're just going to do it ourselves if you won't do it for us, because why not? It becomes fun. It becomes a form of levity. It's a, it becomes a form of 
resistance that makes one giggle. Like, what are you going to do about it? You know? Um, and it yeah. becomes less scary than sort of, you know, especially being deployed on a street where the police now have literally no instruction to take your citizenship seriously. Well, I mean, isn't it, isn't, don't you think that it's, that's reactive? I mean, the level of control of public space at the moment mm -hmm. is, 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 I mean, one, one wonders the thought processes of Moloch is sometimes quite extraordinary, yeah. but it literally is a response to the idea that where can people, what could, how can people uh, use the resources of their life to protest for a different future. It means literally at the streets. So I, mean, I think it's I think it's like an extraordinary anticipation. The establishment never fails to surprise me in how quickly it can move. Mm -hmm. um, but there, I, I think the idea of being arrested for jo joyful creative activity in the public realm is pretty radical. I mean, exactly. the idea that you the idea that you're behind bars because you want to radically beautify a place or mm -hmm. radically reframe it symbolically um which doesn't involve violence uh but which certainly involves dealing with the materiality of a of a bank the front of a bank or the turning of a busy thoroughfare into something else into a carnival space um it, it's it's and the way the way that that commitment to the real um is going to be even more important politically in the future given that we are being urged by techno capitalism to live in useful simulacra you know the great yeah. the great goggles that we see from from apple um i think there's going to be a lust for live yeah. to misquote um the great iggy pop uh and i th i do think that's going to be a reaction i think yeah. people are going to sort of uh they're going to have what they wouldn't say, but which is a sort of an epistemic crisis. You know, what is true? What is real? Who can I believe? Who is the authority? We know the conspiracy theory route that goes down. And one of the reasons why myself and Indra and people in the alternative around us are so, are so concerned with questions of community strengthening and community power is that people who simply begin to distrust the whole public realm uh, have a, have an obvious susceptibility to certain kinds of political appeal, certain kinds of folk deviling, uh, and certain and a certain regime of truth which declares that it's it's mm -hmm. true news as opposed to fake news, mm -hmm. slow news or slow truth or we truth, um, uh, also practical useful truth, things that help you to consciously and concertedly strengthen your immediate conditions. Um, you know, these will be the truths uh, that uh, are, a, are, a battle, are, are going to be battled over. Um, and I think one of the things that we talk about in the alternative, um, uh, which is a kind of political prototyping laboratory, is the importance of local media mm. and the importance of the, not just local media projected down onto the, lo onto the local or or um, misrepresenting it from a sort of cor corporate Ghanaian Ghana newspaper corporation perspective. But local media that is uh, cosmo-local, you know, that both describes the conditions of the place that you're in and draws down global perspectives and, and, and uh, alliances from the web. So a, a, a super-powered locality uh, d desiring knowledge uh, in order that it makes things tangibly better for them in that locality is, is, a, is I think, a healthy process. W you know, waiting for the next wave of council elections is not necessarily the best way to do that, you know. But, you know, identifying neutral buildings, meeting the, 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 the utility of those buildings up to needs and then finding a way to make it happen, local council, local authority or not, I think begins to bring excitement uh, back to Absolutely. people's uh, political, everyday political lives. And everyday political, uh, uh, the, the, the spread of mutual aid networks and mutual aid practice during the, the pandemic is great. I would love, um, in the words of Roberto Unga, for there to be innovation without s systemic crisis, but it mm -hmm. seems to be the success systemic crisis. So in a sense, having the ideas lying around and the practices lying around, as the neoliberals would say, ready to be used, is what we are doing and what we have to do for the next unpredictable crisis to come as a consequence of baked-in climate change of a, of a critical planet, as you would put it. 
Um, and I think that I think that's it's not just that wouldn't just be nice and bucolic to have. It's also politically necessary because people who feel isolated in their communities, oppressed by planetary and social conditions, with no trust in any of the instruments that have been asked to believe would, would make these conditions are, are remediable or accountable, these people are susceptible to fascism. Let's just call it mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. And fascism is 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 a modern, um, uh, technologically calibrated. Um, subtly motivational fascism of the 21st century is will be a terrifying affair. So I think it's it's politically imperative to think of creative, powerful localities and communities, and and to do that as a as a kind of strengthening of character, I a strengthening of of resilience and imagination. Combination of resilience and imagination. There must also be imagination. I completely agree with you. And I think what's so exciting about the idea of those kinds of projects of communities getting together and being like, why not? Why yeah. shouldn't we take over this huge landowner's land to plant food and feed all of us, including the landowner, if he so wishes to, to partake? Mm -hmm. Why not? Like, who's going to stop us? And I think what these acts of resistance do that is maybe different to protesting on the street is they are generative, as you say. They like they do create mm -hmm. something rather than just going up against something and they are necessary as part of the ecosystem of action. But the other thing mm -hmm. is it gets other people who don't consider themselves as act to be activists on board. And then, get, then it gets the local media on board because if the state comes in to shut that down, to shut down mutual aid networks, then the state really reveals itself for its real purpose as opposed to the simulacra of... I don't know, storing citizen information and providing, because we all know yeah. that that is not, in fact, what the state's purpose is, but it reveals itself in that moment. Then once you get local media involved in telling that story, you inspire other people to take those same actions, then you have a decentralized network of people who are saying, well, why not, actually? What are you going to do to mm. stop us? Mm -hmm. And then that creates a different, a different kind of national movement. And I think it's, it's trying to think about how to be slippery, in a sense, Flippery mm. in the way that, well, actually, if you stop us, you're going to be revealing yourself and your motivations in a way that normally you spend most of your time whipping up public fury and public narrative in order to, to mask oneself. Mm. Mm. And so to come out against us means that you're really coming out against the people um, whom we represent, not just in this community, but on this island, say. And I think that's why those actions of being like curious and imaginative and together, I think that's why it breeds resilience and imagination mm. because you are essentially creating a little bit of a womb almost where like, well, if you take this one down, what are you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to keep going out and taking down all the other wombs, at which point you won't have your political support that you need. And I think that's what's yeah. kind of exciting about this moment, you know, we're having the same conversations that we were having in the 70s. I yes. say we, <laughs> but I mean, you know, as the moment with the yeah, Limits yeah. to Growth report published in 1972, with this awareness Absolutely. that we needed different men energy, degrowth, consumption, population, even then, all this kind of stuff. We're having the same conversation, but what is different is the materiality of people's lives. People mm. are not well off now. There is not this boom mm. that is sweeping away the minority world who, who hold a lot of power um, in sort of the global world. And so I really do think the time is ripe for change. I really do think that if transformation could happen, it would be now because there is nothing left, as you said, especially Gen Z. They only have their imagination. They only have the power of story. And so why wouldn't they try to do something else? If they have been given nothing, nothing, when somebody's back is up against the wall, they're going to say, right, well, I'm going to leave then, actually. Thank you very much. Yeah. Why should I stay here in this position that you've put me in? I'm going to go off and do something else. And that is, I think, the main difference between now and the fact that these conversations were present 50 years ago. You have people that are crying out for change because it has become very clear that the system is not interested in looking after them and was never built to look after anybody. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. I mean, if, if you can allow me to be a wee bit, uh, dabble into a wee bit of political philosophy, um, there's, two, there's two 
there's two figures in my mind that I'm thinking of at the moment. One is Keynes, my Maynard Keynes, yeah. who's 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 at, at the who the anniversary of his pamphlet, the economic consequences for our grandchildren. I think is in tw in 2025. That'll be a hundred years since he wrote it, and. His his point in that piece was to look was looking at automation was looking at the amount of uh, wealth that it generated, and saying that the problem of the future is how to deal with the fact that work will become decentered in our lives. The, the challenge of living will be to live wisely, agreeably, and well, uh, rather than productively. Uh, I, and I think it's quite interesting to think about Keynes, who was a, a brilliant mathematician, mathematician and economist, but was also a bohemian and was was living. Um, experientially in, in an unalienated environment where people could express exactly who they wanted to be in terms of gender, in terms of genre, in terms of uh, artwork. Everything was everything was free in his reality, but he was a, a, a the ultimate top-down management-oriented economist. But he, could, he was able to kind of project a future which is two years away and from which we are incredibly distant uh, in terms of the possibility of having this kind of using productivity to live this wise, agreeable, and well-being oriented life. Um, so that's just the kind of, we can, we can push it back even further than the, than the counterculture, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. people imagining that modernity, that productive modernity could, could transcend itself and become a, a supporter of human flourishing, you know, rather than as it is at the moment, literally threatening human flourishing and also, um, instrumentalizing human well-being through controls of consciousness through various consciousness industries. So one thing, Keynes. The other one is the Italian Marxists, people like um, Paolo Verno and Antonio Negri, who talk about exodus. They talk about people not just resisting against the industrial system, but ex having an exodus to a different system in a different place with different tools. Um, their two concrete experiences are Ita Italian workers facing the automation of their factories in the early 70s, with, with which, which was the response to workers' agitation in the 60s and 70s. So the, the Italian Fiat and so forth decided to automate them out of existence. So that was a, sort of a dynamic. And then the other one was pirate radio. So they were all involved in pirate radio of um, setting up um, systems on, 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 on unexplored frequencies and beaming out radical or different kinds of entertainment or different kinds of content to to the people. So, um, so but so the so the idea that uh, so those are just two helpful sort of political concepts: the idea of exodus, you know, uh, and the idea that we have been dreaming for a long while of of uh, using human productivity to, as it were, uh, escape necessity. Um, and I suppose I still want that to be. Part of the discussion, I think. I think what is so fascinating to watch the media at the moment, the way that they are beginning to sort of demonise uh, both uh, sexual and gender diversity and green policies. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's an absolute agenda to otherize both of these um, fecundities. I would say both of these riches, richnesses, uh, and we should we should know our quality, but know what we have to do by the quality of our enemies. Um, and I, I think it's, I think the, the, what's good, what's instructive and useful about right wing media is that they are often preternaturally sensitive to the radical, you know? So I think we can, I think we can sort of precisely see what it is that they want to suppress, which is, I think has come from, has had an accelerated moment from COVID, which is the whole question blandly described as quality of life, mm. but actually is 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 that and deeper? It's existential angst about the, the purpose of the job you're in, the stuff you're surrounded with, the uh, unpredictability of the weather that you're in, the calamities that are, that are being transmitted to you through the mainstream media. Um, I think that there's, um, I think George Monbiot actually in one of his books called it a metaphysical mutation. A metaphysical mutation. Who does that help? But what it points to, you know, is a kind of deep shift uh, a shift that it, if it, it if it if it um induces anything it could easily induce panic and loss and fear and frameworks falling down uh and on the other side it could invite a level of activism imaginative activism that um builds on the past but which is unprecedented 
And I think that unprecedented thing, um, I, I sort of, who could have anticipated, um, Greta Thunberg as, as a, as a, as a small physical symbol of a great tidal wave. It's that kind of oxymoronic person, <laughs> figure, figures. The absurd. The absurd, the, I, I simply don't, I, no, I don't necessarily understand what's standing before me, but I know that it has a power. But, mm. but and and I'll, I'll speak as a musician. I mean, people respond to figures like Bowie, for example, uh, because they of his sort of protean nature. I mean, this is why I would always go back to popular culture as a resource rather than as a mm -hmm. as a seduction or a or a or a, or a transfiction, um, because in 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 public and for all of his career. Uh, he emphasized the, the joy of being protein, of changing and shift changing, shift shaping, so shape shifting <laughs> and, and changing one's boundaries mm. uh, as a popular phenomenon. Mm. So, so it's one of the things that I picked up in the play, I think in 2004, is that, is that what, one must stay close to popular culture because even if you think about pop music, um, it, it is inherently utopian. I mean, it's all, it, it's love is the number one topic. Loss of love is the number one topic. It's usually, um, monogamous, uh, lo love or it's very, it can be heteronymous love. And then sometimes it just goes to completely different, almost love of nature, love of technology, um, love of, uh, anything, you know, that's the theme of, that's the theme of everyday popular culture, you know, mm -hmm. is, is the aspiration to love now. You know, we shouldn't stray too far from that. Um, and, and even that romantic impulse, uh, throbs through most popular culture, I think is a buried utopian impulse. It's, it's a dream of an unalienated zone of living. Um, it's, 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 it's a kind of dream that we, can, we do not need to live in an alienated state. Again, to quote my great hero, Roberto Unger, point of living is to die only once. The point of living is to die only once, or as Bob Dylan would say, he not busy being born is busy dying. So, you know, again, and I'm just quoting Bob Dylan and Roberto Unger, the philosopher and the Nobel Prize winner, uh, because there's an imaginative leap, right? That's what art and culture can do. And I read one of your columns recently. I think it was one of your co Colombian interview that you did with a, with a Colombian activist, mm. where you, you basically said at the end, you know, what about culture as and the and one's interior relationship to culture and that experience of imagination? How about that being the resource that we that we we slowly dimly come to realise that we have? Mm. And I quite I, I completely I completely agree with you. And if, and if I completely agree with you, do we have an interview anymore? <laughs> oh, we've got an interview. <laughs> oh, we've got an interview, Pat. This has been such an extraordinary conversation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My final question for you is, who would you like to platform? Well, number one, I would platform uh, my partner, Indra Adnan, who co-founded The Alternative uh, with myself, co-initiated it. Uh, she's written a book called The Politics of Waking Up, which I think if you're looking for Im uh, imagination in collective uh, and individual and planetary living is the best book that you could read. So I'd totally platform her. Um, the other person I would platform is Kate Rayworth, I've who I think who I think has created a visual metaphor, um, which will which could steer us to be off the precipice in terms of the the band of living that she describes between planetary limits and you know, basic human needs. Uh, there's enough of a play space. Mm. If you want a play space, there's a play space. Play within that space, but accept that it's that it's circumscribed. Um, and she is a brilliant. She's the key, she's the Keynes of her day, mm. basically. Um, and then the last person, as I say, I've quoted him several times, but um, it would be the Brazilian philosopher Roberto Mangabeira Unger, who um, uh, was Obama's tutor, as a great friend of Cornel West. And is the best theorist of um, human potential that I've ever read. Um, and his perspective on automation, which is nice to be left with, is that let the machines do the repeatable 
so that humans can do what they do best, the unrepeatable. So that those, those three people on a platform would be, I, I could listen to them all day. <laughs> Pat, thank you so much. Uh, you're very welcome, Rachel. Thank you. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.